Thank you for joining us for this second session of the symposium. I'm pleased to welcome you um, and to also uh, present you with uh, new talks by Lynn, Co Lynn Cook and Bill Antes. As I mentioned earlier, Marcy Kwon won't be able to join us today, sadly. A uh, quick reminder, remi reminder, closed captioning is available by activating uh, the CC button at the bottom of your screen, and we will follow the same format as earlier, so you can drop questions in the Q&A feature below. Valérie Rousseau uh, will be our host for this session, titled The Inside Out uh, Conundrum, and uh, in which we will reevaluate the American understanding of self-taught art across various contexts in the interwar period. Valérie Rousseau um, is curatorial chair for exhibition and senior curator at the American Folk Art Museum, where she overviewed the exhibition Morris Hirschfeld Rediscovered, among many other projects. Hi, Valérie. Hello, thank you, Mathilde. It is wonderful to be here today uh, in the company of, of, of so many inspirational colleagues. So welcome to the session number two, the Inside Outside Conundrum uh, with Lynn Cook and Bill Antes. Uh, this session will explore how categories of self-taught art, folk art, native art have been defined negatively, supporting hierarchical discourses and reinforcing boundaries with dominant elitist practices. I'm going to open a PowerPoint first. Um, here we go. Do you see it well? Yes, it's all good. good thank you. So despite the blurry borderlines uh, surrounding our object of study today, most of us refer to the field as an entity composed of specific groups of artists, researchers, gallerists, exhibitions, and specialized museum, a field shaped in two successive periods, one that loosely developed between World War I and the 1980s, a moment marked by the pivotal role of major collectors, conduits like Sidney Janis, Wilhelm Huldy, Jean Dubuffet, who gathered very distinct artworks like Seraphine Louis, Maurice Rochefield, and John Keane under certain labels as if sometimes they were uniform, timeless, narrowing biographies and mythologizing artistic paths. The second moment of definition of the field is the one which we are in now, critically revisiting its epistemology and giving rise to a growing number of scholarly studies on artists like Horace Pippin, William Edmondson, and Bill Trader. Such contributions finally examine the circumstances of these artists' discovery and legacies of collectors. While some speakers uh, today will provide a complementary historical overview of how the American art world assimilated and marketed the works of underrepresented practitioners during the interwar period, both uh, Lynn Cook and Bill Antes in this session have effectively centered their presentations on the artist's perspective and creative agency. Such an approach resonates uh, with in-depth focus conducted during recent years with the development of an exhibition about the revolutionary psychiatric practice of Frances Tosquelles, currently at Arena Sofia in Madrid and coming soon to AFAM in June. For instance, we better understand that Auguste Forestier, a patient at the Saint Alban Psychiatric Hospital during World War II and one of Dubuffet's Arbre Protégés, was active, actively involved in the distribution of his sculptures within the surrounding community of the asylum and among avant-garde artists who were hidden there on the site of the asylum with members of the French resistance. Such studies put in perspective the authority of the narrator with a clear sense that these artists were often silenced in the shaping of their narratives. Issues of appropriation and dominant discourses brings us back to the, reflex the reflections of Aimé Césaire on the Negritude. In 1956, Césaire wrote, quote, there are two ways of getting lost, wall segregation in the particular or dilution in the, in the universal. 
my conception of the universal is that of a universal enriched and deepened by the coexistence of all particulars. For this, we need to have the patience to take up the task anew, the strength to invent our path instead of follow, the strength, the strength to clear it already made forms, those petrified forms that obstruct it, end quote. Césaire's remark still applies to our contemporary challenges and inability to negotiate differences. It incites the development of expertise in researching the specific vocabulary of an artistic language away from pre-imposed grid of criteria and standards of works produced under very different circumstances. It is from this angle that Bill Entes revisit Oscar, Oscar Howe's indigenous aesthetics, quote, that link our modernism not to European precursors, but to an identity and culture rooted in specific lands and traditions. In 1959, Howe say, quote, this is our art, and here is where we are making our last stand. The least we can do is to fight this last battle that Indian culture may live forever, end quote. The invaluable catalogue raisonné uh, of Maurice Hirschfeld assembled by Susan Davidson allows us to dismantle an all too often tunnel vision of self-taught artist. Looking at the chronology of his paintings, it is striking to realize that Hirschfeld regular, regularly circled back on themes over his seven years of creative activity, pushing away the praised value of progress in the art. He likely reused parts of the same preparatory drawings, probably with the support of tracing paper, to execute renderings of animals and women, bringing to mind the workshop interior of the fashion designer with cut patterns and dress forms. Noting as well the remarkable obsessiveness in which he decorated the backgrounds of half of his body of works with repeated motifs and brush strokes. I would ask if it was, for instance, the result of a trance-like soothing daily activity to alleviate his physical, physical pain. This catalog of works also reveals that his paintings seem generally formed of blocks of stitched section like quilts as if the overall dream-inducing power of an Henri Rousseau painting loses in Hirschfeld's its unity at the profit of a formal exercise. I would suggest as a closing remark uh, that issues of artistic boundaries and categorizations can also be viewed from the angle of the peer recognition on the basis that trained artists and communities of professional artists engage in sets of ritual reciprocal engagements, common art historical grounds and vocabularies, which all shaped and still perpetuate this inside-outside conundrum. Alan Bonnes's essay, The Conditions of Success, How, to modern, How the Modern Artist Rises to Fame, written in uh, 1989, proposed, the, uh, artistic fame, uh, proposed that the artistic fame is predictable and follows a four-stage process from peer recognition to critical recognition, patronage by collectors and dealers, and then finally public acclaim as seen in museum. The confinement of Hirschfeld outside the art mainstream has little to do with the fact that he was trained in a different fashion that is professional counterpart, but a matter of not being part of a network of peers. It doesn't matter if he was aware of the world art history or if he accessed, he accessed, accessed it as a museum goer, nor if reputable insiders included his works in prestigious shows. Urshfield, Seraphine Louis, and John Kane did not participate per se in such a peer system that often defines the language of a profession. On the opposite side of the spectrum, these works appear to embody no rational except their own, reinforcing the image of loners. So to explore further this inside-outside conundrum, I would like now to invite our um, esteemed uh, panelist, Lynn Cook. Thank you. Oh, I will present Lynn. Lynn, um, quickly, 
Uh, Lynn is the Senior Curator for Special Projects of Modern Art at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. She curated uh, numerous major shows, including the Carnegie International, the Biennial of Sydney 1996, and Outliers and American Vanguard Art in 2018. Welcome, Lynn. Hello, um, thank you, Valerie, and thank you to Valerie and um, Mathilde walker Bilho for the invitation to participate in this fascinating symposium. When the Museum of Modern Art presented the exhibition Masters of Popular Painting in 1938, it fulfilled an ambition that the director, Alfred Barr, had laid out some five years earlier, the presentation of three shows devoted to major movements in modern art that he considered had determined and would continue to define the modernist narrative. Cubism and abstract art and fantastic art, Dada and surrealism debuted in 1936. Unlike those two, which MoMA had generated, the, the third in the series, Masters of Popular Painting relied heavily on an exhibition presented in Europe several years earlier with a closely related title, Metro Populaire de la Realité. As Barr's subtitle, Modern Primitives of Europe and America attest, he considered this an international phenomenon and so added a substantial contingent of North American painters for its New York incarnation. In his catalogue preface, he acknowledged the popular or folk art had long existed, but quote, it was only since the apotheosis of Henri Rousseau that individual popular artists have been taken seriously. The purpose of the exhibition, he went on, is to show without apology or condescension the paintings of some of these individuals, not as folk art, but as the work of painters of marked talent and consistently distinct personality. Several of the American artists, like their European peers, had already been shown in galleries in New York. A few were even included in shows at MoMA. Many were first or second generation immigrants with deep roots in Europe. As the movement's fountainhead, Rousseau was represented with the largest selection of works. Landscape and urban scenes of places in and around Paris, mundane still life motifs, and portraits of friends and acquaintances. Ordinary familiar motifs that might be associated with working class experience. The addition of four jungle scenes hinted at the more fantastical reaches of his imaginary, for which he would soon be revered above all. John Kane, who would sometimes be referred to as the American Rousseau, was similarly distinguished amongst the local contingent with an extensive group of works. However, Kane's art aligned slightly differently with the show's categorical paradigms. After emigrating from Scotland as a young man, he labored for decades on the railways. Only when forced by injury to retire, was he able to fulfill a lifelong goal of devoting himself to painting. Soon he submitted his work to the prestigious Carnegie International, an exhibition presented annually at his hometown art museum in Pittsburgh. After three failed attempts, yeah. he succeeded in 1927 when a painting featuring a folk subject, Highland Dancers, not this particular one, but a similar one, was accepted by the show's jury over much debate, it might be said. Given that professional encouragement, Kane doubled down, schooling himself by, for example, copying old master works and learning the protocols of the art system and market. In the bold self portrait he painted and that was soon acquired by MoMA, Kane represents himself as an aging laborer, the toll of years of hard manual work evidenced forthrightly on his bare chest. Critical claim and market recognition increasingly centered on his two preferred subjects, landscapes featuring the steel industry and extensive rail networks from which Pittsburgh acquired its wealth and national identity, and paintings of folkways, most of which focused on Scottish themes. Kane may have mined childhood memories for these scenes of ethnic heritage, but he found more immediate inspiration in the annual folk festival that took place at Kennywood in the environs of Pittsburgh. 
Other works of folkways included one containing Lincoln's Declaration of Independence. It homed in, in, in short, on themes inspirational to all the nation's folk. The contribution to Masters of Popular Painting by most of the other participants, including African-American Horace Pippin and the Bohemian-born and trained Lawrence Lebduska, by then living in New York, similarly referenced everyday life while hewing to standard fine art categories, landscape, genre scenes, portraiture, and still life. Relatively rare were subjects drawn from the more elevated genre of classical religious and historical themes. Variants of, of realist idioms rooted in 19th century precedent were the styles of choice. And here, as we've heard, we might um, set apart Seraphine Luis, not only as the only woman in the whole group, but uh, for the kind of work she was making. The catalog essays characterized the representat representative popular painter in noticeably different terms. Writing from a European perspective, Maximilien Gautier, who is the curator of the earlier European show on which Barr had drawn heavily for his checklist, extolled these artists for remaining, quote, miraculously in a state of innocence. Theirs is the ingenuous habit of tackling the problem of expressing themselves through forms and colors borrowed from the world they see as though no one had ever struggled with that problem before them, Gautier wrote. Unlike their academically trained peers, quote, they have not discovered the easy edge of resorting to conventional attitudes, fashions, and fixed opinions, he concluded. Best known as a writer and curator, curator of shows of early American art, that is, of artifacts created prior to the Industrial Revolution, Holger Cahill, the second uh, contributor, did not go so far in attributing naivete and a childlike character to these artist visions. Rather, he divided their work into two groups, the, artist of the, the art of the craftsman and the art of the amateur. Cahill's preference was clearly for the former, among whom he included Edward Hicks and Joseph Pickett, both deceased. He highlighted their workmanship gleaned from their daily labor, proposing that artisanal knowledge derived from, say, carpentry informed their artistic practices. Beyond these two Americans, he had little to say, and what he did have to say was not particularly positive. Indeed, he cautioned against uncritically embracing this phenomenon, writing that only a rare few, namely Hicks and Pickett, could, quote, could be placed among the first half dozen masters of American painting. His, his measuring stick is therefore still fine art. Cahill's investments were obviously elsewhere in larger social questions. He valued contemporary expressions of longstanding traditions of American folk and vernacular art, primarily as embodiments of the handcrafted, the skilled workmanship of professional tradesmen, at a time when mass production and industrialization were becoming the norm. For him, the rich creativeness of the common man provided an important counterweight to what he lamented as the 20th century's driving force. Quote, contemporary civilization has almost abandoned its form creating function, he wrote, in favor of the sterile mathematics of the machine form. Masters of Popular Painting was a huge success, drawing record attendance and critical acclaim. Among the most incisive reviews was that penned by art historian Robert Goldwater. Like Cahill, Goldwater argued that the salient issue was not who these painters were, but what needs their work served. While the artist's preferred subjects might be strongly informed by their working class identities and everyday experience, the work's audiences, he pointed out, were not the artist's natural social and economic associates, but the educated museum audience, a white middle-class audience. The sense of originality and authenticity but perceived by these museum visitors depended, he argued, on the absence of a mediating self-consciousness. That is, 
the autodidact lacked the self-reflexivity integral to the creation of avant-garde art. In his view, viewers consequently experienced the level of accessibility in the work of modern primitives that they did not find in vanguard art, which required its spectators to engage actively or interrogatively in the interpretive process. In sum, while the popular painter's preference for commonplace familiar subjects doubtless contributed to the audience's comfort level, what in the end was more impactful was the painter's formal language, a quietest figurative realism that made no heightened interpretive demands on the spectator. As we've seen, Barth valued them differently. And he made this clear again when MoMA opened its newly designed flagship facility on West 53rd Street in Manhattan. As we've heard, at the entrance to the suite of galleries de dedicated to the display of the museum's storied collection, he installed a selection of works grouped under the title Modern Primitives, Artists of the People. And Richard uh, has indicated where the Hirschfeld is and the uh, dead ahead, the um, Henri Matisse, uh, sorry, the Henri Rousseau. In the accompanying press release, Barr boasted that no other museum anywhere in the world could rival this collection of self-taught art. Within the ensemble of works familiar from the 1938 exhibition were Kane's self-portrait, Bomboise Before Entering the Ring, and Peronet's The Ferryman of the Moselle. Arguably standouts included two new acquisition, acquisitions, Rousseau's Sleeping Gypsy, which had been purchased at a price that set a record in the museum's collecting history, and Tiger, a painting by a newcomer, the Brooklyn-based Morris Hirschfeld. Tiger was only the third work Hirschfeld had recognized after taking up painting in 1937 upon his retirement as a designer of women's slippers. Barr's strong endorsements was reiterated in a forthright preface he contributed the following year to the first major publication on the subject. They taught themselves American primitive painters in the 20th century, written by collector and curator Sidney Janus. I, for one, think that just as Rousseau now seems one of the foremost French painters of his generation, Barr declared, Certain of our self-taught painters can hold their own in the company of the best professionally trained compatriots. Among 20th century American paintings, I do not know a more unforgettable animal picture than Morris Hirschfeld's Tiger, nor a more moving portrait than John Kane's painting of himself. Bar was not alone in his valuation of Hirschfeld's achievement. In a review of Janice's book, Clement Greenberg, who was to become the leading critical voice of his generation, seconded this appraisal, declaring that Hirschfeld, quote, would hold his own against any competition from living American painters. The museum's well-received Henri Rousseau, I'm sorry, I think I'm out of order. The museum's well-received Henri Rousseau retrospective in 1942 offered guest curator Sidney Janus an instructive model on which to base the Hirschfeld retrospective, which opened at MoMA the following year. So too did the nuanced catalog essay by Daniel Catton Rich, director of the art institution of Chicago, where the Russo exhibition had traveled after New York. Importantly, Catton Rich teased out and then undermined ready-made attributions of naivete, and began the urgent task of deconstructing and testing the kind of knee-jerk stereotypes that framed Rousseau's art and life in terms of innocence, instinct, and ignorance. Janus, with Barr's approval, went one better, including every work in Hirschfeld's oeuvre to date, and offering a didactic analysis of his relationship to art historical tradition and precedent in the form of pedagogical charts and photographic comparisons, which he presented alongside the exhibits in the galleries. The Janus's approach lacked the incisive critical and curatorial acumen of the Barr-Cattenrich team 
doubtless contributed to the avalanche of hostile criticism that ensued, though most of it was directed at the artist's work, which many deemed so inept as to be unworthy of institutional regard. The fallout, as we know, not least Barr's dismissal from his position as director, stalled beyond redemption his decade-long campaign to position this movement as canonical within the narratives of modernist art. Though Barr staunchly defended Hirschfeld's work to the trustees, who appalled by the fiasco, reversed their position on Hirschfeld, he penned no public defense. Subsequently, he neither elaborated his vision, his vision of popular painting as a movement, nor analyzed the work of its key protagonists in any extended text. In short, he was never accorded the, I'm sorry, in addition, he was never accorded the opportunity to revise his initial position in light of subsequent developments, such as, for example, the great works painted by Pippin in his final years, John Brown going to his hanging, 1942, and Holy Mountain, 1944, that is, in the wake of Barr's curatorial endeavors. Barr's advocacy manifested in the form of exhibitions he himself curated and those he oversaw in acquisitions and displays of the collection and in the brief textual statements they required. It was through a curatorial practice that he sought to demonstrate that not only could modern primitives be shown without apology or condescension, but that they could be presented with their peers on an even playing field, as it were. From his, advantage, from his vantage, differences between the credentialed and uncredentialed literally came down to a matter of degree, to forms of training which today we would calibrate as a BFA or an MFA. And for him, I want to argue, that degree did not matter in the sense that it was not a breaking point. Some 80 years later, much has changed. The past decade has seen a wealth of interdisciplinary scholarship that draws on art history, anthropology, American studies, critical race theory, and related fields to amplify and complicate our understanding of American art during the interwar period. It's also pointed out that within the rolling, roiling cultural, social, and economic issues, that the porousness that um, made uh, these transitions across boundaries formally tightly enforced uh, how it was centered in those social, economic, and cultural debates. In addition, monographs and articles devoted to Pippin and John Kane in particular, the two preeminent popular painters of the American interwar era, have transformed our understanding of their practices, revealing the kind of self-criticality in their both their aesthetics and their um, creation of artistic persona that Goldwater singled out as fundamental to the avant-garde practitioner. Today, we no longer use terms such as modern primitives, nor do we employ the criteria underscoring Barr's critical evaluations. Difference is more likely to be calibrated in relation to gender, race, ethnicity, and class than to ma matters of technical training. Above all, difference is understood as relational. It is not a preordained distinction on which categorical identifications rooted in segregation and by extension in marginalization and disenfranchisement may be positive. With the gamut of Hirschfeld's work newly available thanks to Susan Davidson's invaluable catalog Raisonne, the fascinating retrospective Morris Hirschfeld rediscovered and curator Richard Meyer's text in The Master of Two Left Feet, we have the opportunity for the first time in decades to reconsider the question of how to position Hirschfeld and how to characterize his art. Any answer needs to begin with the fact that the artist himself, as well as his foremost advocates across the art world, vociferously and unapologetically positioned his work in relation to European modernism, that is, rather than in relation to American uh, popular painters, beginning with the art of Rousseau. And in this comparison, I want to point out in particular uh, what I see as a critical difference in the two works in that while fantastical, 
Rousseau's um, positioning of the nude on the sofa, it still takes place within, albeit a highly stylized and illusionistic um, world. By contrast, Hirschfeld's does not. We see in these repeated leaf motifs, uh, the single leaf repeated over and over again, that it creates a border, not a space, not an identifiable place. And in the repetition of the birds too, we see how much they act as decorative adornments uh, rather than the source of uh, anecdotal interest as a single um, pigeon uh, appended to the nude might suggest. From considering Hirschfeld's work in relation to European modest, modernism, beginning with the art of Rousseau, it seems a short step to frame his work in relation to the surrealist cadre, his staunchest apologists. But situating him as a surrealist fellow traveler, as it were, does not, I'd argue, provide an exhaustive account. I'll conclude by proposing that Hirschfeld's singular preoccupation with pattern and ornamentation invites placing his work in dialogue with a modernist genealogy centered on the decorative. As part of the lexicon of formal elements at the modern artist's disposal, pattern and ornament have had an uncertain, not to say problematic status in modernist theory and practice. The derogatory force of the epithet decorative, for example, rings loudly across the full span of the last century. That dismissiveness depends in large part on associations with the erotic and pleasurable, with excess and frivolity, luxury and sensuality, the feminine and domestic, and the implied arts and crafts. Pattern and ornamentation are typically employed as subsidiary embellishments, as we see here, and more importantly, here. Appendant to a dominant signifier, they offer supplementary accents that enhance and complement. Their affordances of sensuality, grace, and visual variety. Only rarely have pattern and ornament played a more substantive role in modernist art, when they've become the primary vehicle for radical formal invention and experimentation. Hirschfeld's use of pattern and ornament as both signifiers and formal devices draws on these two usages. Consider, for example, his extensive series of paintings centered on the female nude. In Nude at Window, theatrical red curtains frame the subject who exists in no identifiable space. Again, as I um, was pointing out with girl and pigeons, here there's no ground plane providing a physical support and there's no differentiation between the ground and background. The nude exists in a no place, an immaterial abstracted realm. Increasingly flamboyant and assertive, scenography, ornamental borders, patterns and cartouches vie with the ostensible subject, which initially they threaten to dominate as in nude at window, and finally, as an American beauty, overwhelm. Instrumentalizing and objectifying the female subject, they reduce the figure to the status of a formal prop, a pictorial trope. For me, most compelling, surprising and substantive in many ways in Hirschfeld's later series of works uh, are the animal paintings, which proliferate um, around 1944 and 45, that's what I'm um, going to focus on. Typically, several highly stylized generic creatures from a single species, mostly mammals, are loosely dispersed across the picture plane. The vegetable, vegetal backgrounds often comprise stylized depictions of one or two generalized motifs, an unidentifiable leaf, a flower on a stem, which may or may not give way to sky in the upper reaches of the composition. So broadly are these creatures defined that despite their highly legible profile poses, sometimes it's only the title that confirms identification. 
With generational difference calibrated by size, family resemblance always trumps expressive individuation and pattern subsumes behavioral quirks as signifiers of personality. And I think, I'm thinking here of, um, for example, a comparison with Bill Trailer's work, which although the animals are stylized, they're individuated and they're given uh, particular personalities in many instances, um, his purposes being altogether different from um, Hirschfeld's. Birds, numerically the most frequent amongst the animal's subjects, might appear to be Hirschfeld's default mode for that reason. But I'd argue, to the contrary, that they're the basis of some of his most radical and beguiling works. In Birds on the Grass 1, the two uh, birds which are portrayed as if in flight, which is, I think, birds living in air, an immaterial realm that uh, few other animals that appear in Hirschfeld's um, lexicon uh, inhabit. But these birds in flight are as deeply enmeshed in the material matrix of the ground as their companions standing in profile. Of more weight than any consideration of real world logic is the opportunity that rendering provides for enhancing the range of delicate surface markings on their bodies. One way of approaching these stylized formulations I'd like to suggest is in relation to the genre of mill fleur tapestries that originated in the Low Countries in the 14th century. Not that Hirschfeld was looking specifically at 14th century examples, nor even at the William Morris revivals, which garnered new critical esteem for the genre at the end of the 19th century. Much more pertinent, I think, was his awareness of contemporary ersatz versions of the genre, likely as ubiquitous in the 1940s as they are now. For example, if you um, type in tapestry.com on your browser, uh, what, you, what will come up, uh, or at least it did when I did so, um, was uh, the offer of a cushion cover in a mill flow style, albeit mechanically, um, produced not by hand, um, but very much of that order for the small price of $80. Lynn, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we, you have, it's time to wrap up. Right. Thanks so much. Irrespective of whether it takes the form of high art or kitsch, a tapestry weave synthesizes ground and figure inseparably. They're not merely comprised of the same fibrous material stuff, but fused through the interlace of warp and weft into a unified planar surface. In contrast to printed textiles, there's no separation between the motif and the ground. Decoration and patterning are not applied to a pre-existing cloth surface. In the great cycles of monumental Renaissance and Baroque tapestries, the decorative achieved a rare apotheosis in the history of Western figurative art. In the early 20th century, a new strand emerged in modernism. For example, as seen in the work of the Navis, it took the form, form in both decorative murals and autonomous oil paintings. For the next 50 years, that lineage was galvanized, above all, by the manifold contributions of Henri Matisse. Beginning around 1909 in such groundbreaking paintings as Still Life with Blue Tablecloth, the decorative becomes Matisse's preferred means to unprecedented formal and, ex uh, ex formal and expressive innovation. I'm not saying that Hirschfeld's uh, work does not benefit from his experience in the rag trade. It must inevitably have marked his sense of ev the everyday world, material world around him, enhancing his sensitivity to the essential contribution made by pattern and ornamentation in daily life whether in apparel or furnishings or in artworks that we adorn our domestic walls with. My takeaway from this challenging trifecta of exhibition catalog, a monograph consequently takes the form of a question. Might we profitably view Herschel's textile adjacent paintings through other lenses, above all in relation to a modernist genealogy that prioritizes the decorative? Thank you.
Thank you very much uh, for this rich presentation, uh, Lynn, and especially on uh, this incursion on ornamentation. Um, I would like to invite now uh, our second speaker, Bill Antis. Bill uh, teaches at Pitzer College in Claremont, California. He is the author of the books Native Moderns, American Indian Paintings, 1940-1960, published in 2006, and Edgar, Edgar Heap of Birds, uh, published in 2015, uh, both published by Duke University Press. He is the co-editor of the uh, exhibition catalog, Dakota Modern, The Art of Oscar Owl. Welcome, Bill. Good afternoon. Thanks to Mathilde and Valerie for the invitation and all of their work in organizing today's uh, event. Also thanks to the museum staff who supported this. And especially I wanna thank uh, the ASL interpreters who are doing heroic and uh, challenging work. Um, I'd also like to begin today by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from Los Angeles County in California and that the Los Angeles Basin is called Tavangar by its indigenous inhabitants who call themselves Tongva, Gabrielino, or Quiche. And these people are descended from the original stewards of the unceded lands on which I have the privilege of living and working. I'll be focusing today on the art of Oscar Howe, a Yankton I Dakota painter born in 1915 and who died in 1983. And I also want to acknowledge that my presentation draws on collaborative research for a catalog and exhibition, Dakota Modern, the art of Oscar Howe. The exhibition, and I've listed the opening dates here, uh, was curated by Kathleen Ash Milby. And I was a member of a research team on this project along with Kathleen, who was at the National Museum of the American Indian and is now at the Portland Art Museum. Christina Burke of the Philbrook Museum in Tulsa, John Lukovic of the Denver Art Museum, and Alex Harris, who was our managing editor for the project. And the catalog also includes contributions from eight other authors. Bill, can you go to uh, presenter mode? Yes, yes, I realize now I wasn't doing that. Okay, there we go. Oscar Howe was born in 1915 in Joe Creek, a Dakota community on the Crow Creek Reservation in Northwest South Dakota. And I'll note that the Ocheti Shakawi um, is often the preferred name used by many of the indigenous peoples whose traditional homelands encompass North and South Dakota, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, and are generally known as the Santee or Eastern Dakota, the Yankton, Western Dakota, and Lakota. The name Ocheti Shakawi refers to the seven council fires of these nations. In Howe's lifetime, scholars and tribal members and Howe himself most often use the term Sioux, which is derived from an early French, tra French translation of an Ottawa word to collectively refer to people from these groups and bands. And although some people believe it to have derogatory connotations, many communities still use this term, uh, which is often part of official tribal names. Howe's paternal ancestors were members of the Lower Yankton I Band, which was a division of the Western Dakota that were established in the Crow Creek Agency in South Dakota in the 1860s. Biographical accounts also refer to maternal ancestors who were Santee and involved in the Dakota War in 1862 in Minnesota. And these ancestors may have been among the survivors of the conflict there who were relocated to Crow Creek. Howe and two, his two older brothers, Walter and Edward, were raised in an established reservation community of families who scraped along working rural jobs or farming and were pressured to send their young children to the Pier Indian School, an off-reservation boarding school. Indian schools were run by the federal government or in some cases Christian churches. Their curriculum was based on a model developed by Colonel Richard Henry Pratt, an army officer and veteran of the Indian Wars of the 19th century, who developed an educational regimen for native prisoners of war at Fort Marion in St. Augustine, Florida, and which he later refined and implemented at the federally run Carlisle Indian Industrial School in Pennsylvania, which became the template for a network of Indian boarding schools. Pratt's descriptive phrase for his curriculum and educational ethos, quote, kill the Indian, save the man, unquote, expresses the goal of assimilation that prevailed at Indian schools through the mid 20th century as native children, 
cut off from family ties, were trained in manual trades, and punished for speaking their native languages and practicing their cultural traditions. In addition to the violence of the federal Indian educational system, Howe faced numerous hardships and illnesses as a boy, and after receiving word in 1924 that his mother had died, he was sent home from boarding school, despondent but finally able to recover from his chronic ailments. With his brothers away at school and his father working, his year of recovery included hours spent with his maternal grandmother, Shellface, and one can imagine that she saw the occasion to use their precious time together while he was weakened and resting to tell him stories not only about Dakota beliefs and traditions, but also about resilience in the face of adversity. The young Oscar Howe's time with Shellface influenced him profoundly and would later become the foundation of the sophisticated Dakota, Dakota cultural content that distinguishes his work, and the precious months young Oscar spent with his maternal grandmother should certainly be considered a foundation of his education as an artist. In September 1934, how enrolled at the Santa Fe Indian School in New Mexico, a federally run boarding school where he became a student in the new studio arts program designed by artist and educator Dorothy Dunn. Dunn's program was developed to provide an alternative vocational path for native students. How quickly mastered the studio style promoted by Dunn and characterized by firmly outlined figures, flat colors, simplified or entirely absent backgrounds and nostalgic subjects. The studio style, which caught the interest of anthropologists, art collectors, and popular audiences, embodied many aspects of 20th century modernist primitivism, as well as a distinctly mid-century American search for a usable past. The studio style was not based in any particular regional indigenous visual tradition. It was the mode in which students from multiple tribal backgrounds were encouraged to work. It was a pan-tribal and modern style, but was promoted by Dunn and others as the unschooled, authentic expression of a timeless and essential Native American culture and identity. But the studio style was an institutional in its origins, and in the words of art historian J.J. Brody, it was the result of a symbiosis between, quote, Indian painters and white patrons. While a student at the Santa Fe Indian School, Howe's work was exhibited widely, and in 1934, Paul Cosset, a Beirut-born French-Serbian-American author, artist, and self-styled anthropologist, visited Dunn's studio program, calling the school, quote, the Indian Rome where Indian art has been born anew. The next year, Cosset included one of Howe's paintings in an exhibition in Paris featuring the work of students from the Santa Fe Indian School, title translates as Art of the Redskin Today at the Trocadero. While Howe's original painting and all the works Cosset brought to Paris are now lost, posters printed in Santa Fe advertising the exhibition, including one featuring Howe's design, have survived. The interest in Native arts evidenced by Dunn's program and such, such exhibitions is part of a longer story that we don't have time uh, here to explore fully. Briefly, the aesthetic validation of Native American art played a role in reversing decades of federal Indian policy under Indian Commissioner John Collier, whose Indian New Deal sought to end official policies of detribalization and assimilation, and who insisted that Native American art should be, quote, prized, nourished, and honored, end quote, and that the spiritual values of what Collier poetically termed the Red Atlantis might provide an anodyne for the crises of modernity. Collier created the Indian Arts and Crafts Board, an agency within the Department of the Interior, in 1934, with the mandate to preserve, promote, and regulate the growing market for Native American arts and crafts. The creation of the Indian Arts and Crafts Board represented the federal legislative recognition of the value of Indian culture and identity and its relevance for modern American lives. It had been founded on the belief that Native American arts and crafts had a twofold relevance. First, as bearers of Indian identity, no longer demonized as pagan and primitive, and second, as in the writings of Collier and other reformer ascetes, central to a pluralist and spiritually reawakened American identity. In 1941, a work by Howe, seen here on the left, Plains Indians on Horseback, was included in the exhibition Indian Art of the United States, organized by Frederick Douglass, the curator of Indian art at the Denver Art Museum, along with Rene de Harnancourt, the director of the Indian Arts and Crafts Board. 
Howe's painting, Now Lost, is a rare early example by the artist in that it departs from the pan-tribal studio style as it emulated Plains men's narrative arts conventions. Howe had probably completed the painting early in his studies at the Santa Fe Indian School and sold it to a local collector, Margareta Dietrich, a Philadelphia-born activist for women's and indigenous rights who had arrived in Santa Fe via Nebraska in 1927. The exhibition included only a small number of paintings in what amounted to an ambitious survey of the art of Native North America, ranging from archeological examples to modern works. Although Howe's painting was placed in the section labeled Indian Art for Modern Living, the artists themselves were not presented as modern. Captions for the works illustrated in the exhibition catalog make no reference to the dates of their creation, thus reinforcing the artist's connection to tradition and history, not to their art's modernity. Indian art, timeless and exotic, yet also domesticated, was suggested as progressive decor for the modern consumer. Howe's work, as it appeared in these art world context, is an illuminating example of the place of non-European and outsider arts as they sat in relation to modernism as it was being consolidated at institutions such as MoMA. And as Jennifer Marshall reminded us earlier today, for the 1936 exhibition, Cubism and Abstract Art, MoMA director Alfred Barr created his now famous family tree diagram to illustrate the historical inevitability of abstraction. Non-Western influences such as Japanese prints, Near Eastern art, and Negro sculpture are shown in red, demonstrating their contributions, but also their difference. As Glenn Lowry has written, Barr's diagram possibly drew from other graphic explanations of abstractions development. For example, Miguel Covarrubias's Tree of Modern Art Planted 60 Years Ago, published in Vanity Fair in 1933. In Covarrubias's drawing, the family tree is literally a tree, with a classical Mediterranean head and a West African reliquary sculpture placed near the roots. And while the tree is a biological metaphor for organic growth and development, Covarrubias also included one animal, a bird, to embody the naive painter Henri Rousseau. But note that in both Covarrubias's and Barr's explanatory graphics, Native North American art is absent, even at a moment when it was highly visible in the art world, for example, MoMA's exhibitions and the earlier 1931 exposition of Indian tribal arts at Grand Central Art Galleries in Manhattan, which as the organizers exclaimed, showcased, quote, Indian art as art, not ethnology. After work for the New Deal art programs in the 1930s and army service in Europe and North Africa in World War II, Howe's career and formal education progressed. Milestones included winning the Grand Purchase Prize in Tulsa, Oklahoma uh, at the Philbrook Art uh, Center in its second annual National Exhibition of American Indian Painting in 1947 for his painting, Dakota Duck Hunt. Howe's 1947 painting shows him working in an evolved version of the style promulgated by Dunn and other early supporters of modern native painting. This painting includes a landscape setting that would have been out of place in Dunn's studio. The late 1940s and early 1950s were critical years for Howe's artistic development as he moved away from the studio style, earned a bachelor's degree in art from the Dakota Wesleyan University in Mitchell, South Dakota, and ultimately enrolled at the Master of Fine Arts program at the University of Oklahoma. As he began his advanced studies, Howe was ready to forge his own path and risk his established commercial success within the accepted prescriptions of Indian painting. John O'Neill, as his advisor and principal instructor at the University of Oklahoma, recalled discussions with Howe, quote, the theme being that he was strong enough, a strong enough artist to move into an area where his work would be judged by world standards and not by those applied to Indian painting primarily, end quote. Howe's subsequent work during this period represented a compositional turning point as he began to incorporate the entire pictorial field of the painting and added overtly dimensional forms. His work became more abstract with some hit and miss experimentation, stylistic elements from analytical cubism, such as the fragmenting of an image to show the subject simultaneously from multiple perspectives appeared, and the artist eventually synthesized them into his unique work. 
Woman Buffalo Dreamer, with its abstracted figures casting dramatic shadows, hints at much of what would distinguish Howe's mature work. The undated painting, likely produced around 1952 during Oscar Howe's graduate years in Norman, uh, demonstrates the artist's awareness of world art history, particularly modernism and surrealism, although Howe would ultimately set aside those influences is in favor of abstraction drawn from specifically Dakota or more broadly Osheti Shakoi traditions. Art historian Mark White writes that the painting recalls the quote, elongated forms, desolate plains, and timeless environments of Salvador Dali, Yves Tanguy, and Alberto Giacometti, unquote, and the visionary oniric subject matter of the surrealists, unquote. How adapted these techniques to the depiction of a customary subject, a visionary seer tasked with lo locating bison essential to survival. Buffalo dreamers were most often male, although, although oral tradition does recount female visionaries. Graduate school also challenged Howe to explain his process and the philosophy that shaped his approach as a painter. In his 1953 master's thesis paper titled, quote, An Exhibition of Original Painting in Tempera, Howe explained a highly conceptual methodology that incorporated a, quote, psychological use of catharsis, unquote, wherein he chose to depict the subject at an extremely intense or emotional moment. He engaged, engaged critically with interpreta interpretations of Native American art, which, led, uh, which he claimed led to a formalization that lacked individuality. His paintings, as he described them, quote, are basically Indian in technique, but trend away from the indigenous art, the use of simple linearity and flat patterns expresses the third dimension, unquote. Yet he also repeatedly asserted that the indigeneity of technique is related to a deeper philosophical meaning, such as the origin of the straight line construction from traditional women's arts, such as quill work, and the belief that, quote, a straight line symbolizes unrelenting truth or righteousness. Howe continued to submit works to the Philbrook Annual, which was the major mid-century venue for paintings by Native artists. In 1954, Howe entered three paintings, two of which seen here won purchase prize awards. Victory Dancer, on the right, was awarded first place in the Plains category, and Dance of the Hayoka, on the left, uh, earned the Grand Award that year. And in 1958, Howe entered Umini Wachipi, War and Peace Dance, depicting five angular fingers, uh, figures in shades of uh, blue, pink, and lavender, performing a ritual dance against uh, a starkly abstracted ritual enclosure. Needless to say, Howe was shocked when his painting was branded as inauthentic and disqualified from competition. As explained by the panel of two white jurors and the Comanche painter, Jesse E. Davis, who had been a previous Philbrook uh, Grand Prize winner, it was, quote, a fine painting, but not Indian. That is, the jurors argued that the painting was not an authentic expression of Howe's Indian heritage and identity. And however, although the painting was excluded from consideration for prizes, it was kept, with the, kept on view with the work of nine other artists in the Plains Regional category at that year's exhibition, as you can see here from the uh, exhibition brochure. It is now uh, missing, but I can talk more about that later if you're interested. How was infuriated to hear that his painting uh, 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 was, it was excluded from judging and he was shocked by the narrow definition being applied to his and other native artists work. He sent a fiery missive, uh, now, now famous, to Gene Snodgrass, the curator of American Indian art and organizer of the annual. Howe's letter is uh, justifiably famous. The letter and the controversy that precipitated it signaled the end of the predominance of the studio style. Howe wrote, quote, there is much more to Indian art than pretty stylized pictures. Every bit in my paintings is a true studied fact of Indian painting. Indian art com can compete with any art in the world, but not as a suppressed art. And he concluded, I only hope the art world will not be one more contributor to holding us in chains. Howe's letter precipitated a change at the Philbrook Annual. In an internal memo dated July 11, 1958, Snodgrass wrote, quote, it now seems evident that Philbrook Art Center has reached a crucial time with the Indian Annual. And in 1959, still, Philbrook staff added categories for sculpture and what was now termed non-traditional painting. But this new term, which seemed to play into the same logic that had characterized his abstract paintings as not Indian, 
seem to miss the point of Howe's complicated work and his positioning as an artist. In many respects, Howe was an artist ahead of his time. Yet in other ways, Howe was an anachronism. As historian Phil Deloria has written, we get the feeling of, quote, time slightly out of joint, unquote. When Howe was labeled incorrectly by some critics as a cubist, it linked him not to the most forward-looking art of the post-World War II era, but a moment in European art that had made its mark nearly 40 years earlier, before Howe was born. Non-European artists have often been cast as belated and derivative in a version of art history that places the highest value on progress and innovation. Such a judgment fundamentally misreads what is most important about Howe and what has made him a resource for generations of native artists who have come of age in his wake. Anything but non-traditional, Howe's greatest success was in tapping a deep well of inspiration in indigenous aesthetics and knowledge that linked his modernism not to European precursors, but to an identity and culture rooted in specific lands and traditions. Howe created an art that was committed to Osheti Shakoi culture of the past, present, and future, and Howe expressed an unwavering commitment to, quote, bringing the best things of Indian culture into the modern way of life. This aspect of Howe's art links him most clearly to subsequent generations of indigenous artists who practice what scholars, including Tuscarora artist and theorist Jolene Rickard, have termed visual sovereignty, and what Ojibwe writer Gerald Visner called survivance to describe the ongoing resistance to white supremacy and settler colonialism with the perseverance and resilience that characterize native people, communities, and tribal nations. The more fundamental issue, however, was beyond Howe's control and not specific to him as an individual. Historical and institutional racism made it difficult for American cultural gatekeepers, including the press and the Art Academy, to characterize his work. Was it Native American? Was it modern? It was not until the early 1980s that scholars began to consider that essentializing of Native American art is a problem that needed attention as Native and other non-white artists were rejecting the art establishment's one-size-fit-all categorizations. As for other artists of color at the time, different standards were applied to the reception and, inter and interpretation of Howe's work than to mainstream, mostly male, white artists. Oscar Howe was a curiosity. He represented a new phenomenon in American society as more Native people transitioned from rural to urban communities. At the same time, Native people wrestled with their own identities as their livelihoods and experiences shifted dramatically in the span of only one or two generations. As Native communities struggled with poverty, alcoholism, and crime, how and many of his Native contemporaries strove to reconcile feelings of shame with pride in their heritage. B. Medicine, a Lakota anthropologist, wrote of how, quote, the visionary was also a realist making a conscious effort to live in a bicultural world, a world of white standards and Dakota tradition. Thank you. Thanks so much, Bill. Uh, what an illuminating uh, presentation and, and Natalia, as it offers a lot of parallels to, to think about uh, current issues we are um, experiencing with self.art. Um, I would like to invite you both, uh, Lynn and, and, and you, to, to join the screen now and uh, maybe go through a few questions. Uh, Bill, do you still, um, you, you will be with us for another 15 minutes? Good, thank you. So um, in light of these moments of tension and contention related to the inclusion of uh, artists like uh, Maurice Urshfield and Oscar Howe in, in, in these narratives, uh, do you currently perceive in your respective professional field um, some institutional resistance or tensions among peers or also dissonant um, positions from the part of the artists themselves uh, in the current research that you are uh, developing? I suppose I can take a first shot at that. Um, I have encountered some uh, friction from indigenous artists, particularly contemporary indigenous artists who actually would prefer that how and their work not be included in our histories of modernism and our framing of the contemporary. There's a I've encountered some, although I wouldn't 
call this uh, unanimous or entirely representative, but I have encountered some comments suggesting that we should be talking about how really still only in the context of Osheti Shakoin or Dakota, or maybe more broadly, indigenous arts. Um, and that to kind of shoehorn him into a history of modernism in hopes of transforming a history of American art um, is in some ways a disservice to what uh, is unique about him and what, what is important about him. I'm kind of of two minds about that, obviously, um, uh, as a historian of American art who works with indigenous artists, uh, but I find that an interesting uh, kind of echo of the way how defined his own practice back in the 50s. Um, I think I'd answer the question in relation not so much to um, divided positions amongst colleagues, but to the, what might be said to those who subscribe to an idea of outsider art in, in the terms in which it was framed by Roger Cardinal, um, which I think is still very strong. Unfortunately, it's, um, it's, it determines a great deal in terms of public reception, although it's totally unviable. And by that, I mean, um, the category is, as Cardinal himself came to acknowledge, it's an ideal uh, notion, not an actual one. Um, but it posits a creator who's internally driven, indifferent to the world around him, or him as it was at the time, um, and uh, motivated by inner, inner feelings, uh, not interested in communication, not part of community, um, and therefore uh, hermetic, solipsistic, and ultimately incommensurable. Um, clearly, I don't subscribe to that. And uh, I think the battle is kind of to try and dislodge this persistent and misleading uh, stereotype. And this is happening from many directions, both within the museum through curatorial ac activities, exhibitions, and acquisitions, and through a great deal of new scholarship, which is bringing a rigor and in-depth research to the subject that has never happened before. Which might lead to my, my second question. Uh, Bill, it is amazing to witness the many resources uh, you found regarding uh, Oscar House position toward the art establishment and its refusal to you know, one size fits all categorizations. This is a, something that um, that is often lacking uh, with self taught artists like like Maurice Hirschfeld. That we we start to uncover more um, uh, these uh, uh, first person testimonies, if you want. Um, to you both, uh, Lynn and Bill, uh, can you expand a little bit more on your methodology that prioritizes uh, the, the artist's self-representation, maybe using concrete examples uh, in current research? Uh, do you want to go ahead, Bill, why I think of Sure, sure. Uh, when I and my collaborators began this project, um, amongst a certain circle of art historians and curators, there was a certain kind of understanding of how, and a lot of it was built around that painting, Umini Wachipi, and the story and the letter. And that's kind of as far as most understanding went. Uh, we were lucky to find a very rich archive, um, part of it held by Howe's family, um, and part of it, uh, or the rest of it, at the University of South Dakota, where Howe taught for many years. Um, and it was a remarkably intact uh, archive, um, which was incredibly helpful in our research. In some ways, it's a, an index of uh, how uh, Howe's kind of lack of esteem or notoriety in the larger art world that all of this material had been sequestered in Vermilion, South Dakota, and a couple of other places for half a century and not been much explored. Um, so we set out hoping to just kind of tell a, a longer story uh, with with what we could find in Howe's own words, because um, there was a lot of it to work with. Um, but we were fortunate to have a really deep collection because he had um, an institutional affiliation and he had a couple of um, 
uh, mediators, uh, to use a word that came up earlier today, who kind of undertook to be caretakers and stewards of all that material and made sure that it ended up in an institutional home rather than being lost. So maybe he's exceptional in that way. And I second your um, statement in that the archive, the presence of a strong archive or its absence is absolutely critical to this. And I think we can see it in a comparison, say, of Anne uh, Monaghan's monograph on Pippin, which is transformative and based on an extraordinary amount of archival work, not all in one place, but across a whole field of from military history and, and, and so on. And um, by really rigorously piecing this together bit by bit, she's uh, given us a sense of Pippin as embedded in a network of, um, of the art world and artist associates and uh, a conceptual and um, critical way of uh, approaching his work as, uh, context by context in relation to say commissions, in relation to certain kinds of exhibition possibilities and so forth. And on the other hand, we have Bill Trailer, uh, where there's no, really no archive to speak of. And we've seen in the case of Leslie Amberger, who made a remarkable show of Trailer's work and produced um, a very large catalog. And Leslie was able to, or, or created a biography that was nuanced and complex, um, that was groundbreaking. But in terms of interpreting works, there's a, a barrier, there's, there's, and as Kerry James Marshall says in the um, essay, he contributed to that catalog. Basically, when you look at these works with complex subjects, with a lot of animals and figures, you're on your own. You're up to, it's speculative. Match your wits against those of the artist. And I think in this, these, and, and so one, response, just to conclude, is um, taking Sidia Hartman's idea of critical fabulations and mm -hmm. turning them into, say, both curatorial fabulations and critical fab fabric fabrications, drawing on literature and other kinds of material to create um, hypothetical context and uh, maybe in that way throw light on the meaning meanings in the work, if not it, um, literally on the intentions of the maker. Mm. Great. Uh, Mathilde, uh, do you want to take a question from the from the audience to um, to address to Bill? Uh, I have not seen. Um, yes, I have a question for for Bill. Um, uh, so someone is asking, um, how do you make sense of the art establishment's understanding of Oscar Arrow's work as self-taught? And then just, uh, you know, unpack this, what appeared as a big contradiction. So, yeah, and, you know, going back to that time. Yeah, it's it's something that, that jars, um, because how was anything but self-taught, um, uh, you know, earning an MFA in the 1950s when... I would I would hazard a guess that many professional artists had not bothered to get the graduate uh, degree, um, and uh, uh, but I also think you know as I kind of alluded to that I, I think that there's a, a certain kind of training we can uh, identify in just his upbringing uh, with his maternal grandmother too, um, and yet kind of persistently uh, throughout his career he's kind of caught between a rock and a hard place, on the one hand, being identified as a primitive um, in certain kinds of publications and always linked to, uh, to that identity um, and marked in terms of distance from the mainstream, but at other times uh, being seen as inauthentically indigenous because of his connections to world art history and modernism. So it's he's, for me, one of those characters that encourages us or gives us the opportunity to think a little bit about the constructedness of some of these categories at all or i think i think it was lynn who was using the word um uh 
uncredentialed as opposed to untrained, which I think is probably a more helpful uh, uh, term to use um, when thinking about uh, these artists' kind of status uh, in an art world. We actually have a question on, on that. Um, and someone asked us to discuss what the term self taught means and if you can give us it's too, too much like a large question for us, but maybe just to tell us your position toward that word and if you, yeah, if you, you want to uh, use it. I'm going to punt that one to Lynn. <laughs> um, well, self-taught was used in the 30s and 40s, usually to mean uh, lacking academic, formal academic training in uh, credentialed art schools. And with that would come lack of a knowledge of art history and its protocols. But what we've seen not only on, um, through work on artists, uh, autodidacts so-called from the interwar years, but perhaps even more importantly, say on Henry Darger uh, in the work of Michael Moon or um, Sunford Thomas, um, sociological anthropological studies point to what uh, anthropologists call fireside training on the mm -hmm. one hand so the the things you learn in community in in young women it would be how to sew quilts and so quilt making uh, you don't go to school for it but you're taught it nonetheless and and both your mother and grandmother and and the women within the community would um provide skill sets for a young woman who would then um, gain expertise in it. So there's that kind of training that doesn't register in the term self-taught. And then there's the kind of training that's a some, in some ways a self-schooling or homeschooling that you find in say Henry Daga, who um, was immensely well-versed in popular a popular print material of the time, whether religious and uh, cartoons and, and more generally in, in newspaper uh, presentations, and used that very much as the ground on which to build a very sophisticated idea, um, a kind of allegory of um, using the civil war, using race relations, uh, um, the, sorry, the Civil War and other narratives um, in terms of a story that's the Vivian girls and the oppressions they undergo, but can be written as I can be unpacked, as I said, um, allegorically. So there's so there's that kind of schooling, which is um, someone putting together their own set of um, materials needed to build a very complex uh, conceptual practice. So I think we're going to wrap up now the second session, but thank you, uh, Bill, and thank you, Lynn and, and Valérie uh, for, for this wonderful talk and also for you know, walking us through the complexity of the, of the term self-taught and also the interwar period. So thank you so much.